Welcome everyone to our second talk for the um, Energy and Environment Research um, webinar series. Uh, we have the pleasure today of having Professor Sotidis Pratsinis uh, from ETH um, Zurich, and who will be giving a talk about flame made gas sensing devices of high select selectivity. Um, so all yours, Sotidis. Thank you, Nelia. And thank you, Kai, for giving me the opportunity to talk to your uh, uh, center seminar. And all of you guys that take your after lunch uh, hour here to spend uh, with me. And as I say on this slide, I will give you the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes a fragrance of knowledge about flame made gas sensing device of high selectivity. I come from Eteha Zurich. You know the place, it's, a, it's an old school pretty famous uh, for in very uh, many different aspects, but here we will focus on um, primarily on uh, flame synthesis of materials because this is what I have been working in the past uh, 35 to 40 years actually by now. And uh, in our laboratories, we focus very heavily on the fundamentals and uh, on applications. We are really doing fundamental research, but with well-defined applications. And let me start with the fundamentals. What do I mean with that? We truly focus on particle structure and size distribution. And since this is an energy center, let me point out some of the energy related results that we have on that frontier with uh, my, uh, one of the, my most recent PhD students, Dr. George Kelesidis. What do you see here? We have been able to actually reveal how soot evolves the structure of soot as a function of the number of primary particles that it contains. And you can see here the so-called fractal dimension as a function of the number of primary particles. And you can see here as soot forms in the flame, actually we can develop and follow very closely the structure in close agreement with various experimental studies all the way from tiny, tiny particles, the so-called nascent soot, to the mature suit, either with the so-called mass fractal dimension or what is more typically discussed in this field, this mass area fractal dimension that we DFM as we call over here. In another aspect, we are looking into the oxidation of soot, as you can see here. This is the mobility of diameter of soot after oxidation. And you can see here, for example, how in the beginning soot as a function of a different temperatures, you can see that the soot actually mass is reduced, but the mobility diameter is not. So at lower temperatures, most of the oxidation takes place inside the particles. So we're able to distinguish between internal and external oxidation. And only after at very high temperatures happens what the well known oxidation of soot you expect so the particle size to decrease. So being able to distinguish between internal and external oxidation of soot from first principles, we are able to understand how it happens and being able to learn that very small particles of soot, this so-called nascent soot, is oxidized much, much faster than the classic result of the so-called uh, the NSC expression for oxidation, the, and, uh, the, the one that is used widely in the field. And finally, on the fundamentals, this year, we were able, believe it or not, to close the mass balance during soot oxidation. Here it is the volume fraction of soot. And people over the years, I can even show you papers of last year, try to people to match the soot mass fraction. They are still off by a factor of four or five. However, by accounting what we have here, the structure and the size distribution of soot, we're able to get you know, this big difference of uh, spherical particles versus those of agglomerate particles and come extremely close to the data, as you can see here by plotting the volume fraction of soot as a function of the height above the burner. This basic understanding now has facilitated a quantitative design, process design. So now in our laboratories, we, can, we make a variety of particles up to five kilograms per hour as you can see here, and the students having proper protection, it is well before 
nowadays where everybody wears masks, we had to wear masks actually when you make these particles because and even preserve the atmosphere in the laboratory about 30 to 40 millibars below atmospheric to assure that particles never leave the laboratory out to go to other people's labs or offices. So this is well, and in fact, when the COVID pandemic started, our laboratory uh, distributed our masks to the local hospital here because people did not have them. So this is actually came quite handy. And you will see here a major breakthrough in the London Stock Exchange. Just in a few minutes, I'm coming to that. So not only we are able to scale up processes, but most importantly, to come with innovation, with novel processes, because this quantitative understanding of the fundamentals allows you to really design new processes. And this is the so-called picture of our flame spray pyrolysis that has generated hundreds of papers. Just a review came out with 500 papers on, on the field and different applications. And this now brings me to the second axis of uh, my laboratory applications. And uh, over the years, we have contributed to novel heterogeneous catalyst, batteries, biomaterials, and so on. Among them, one of them was antibacterial nanosilver. And uh, this was important about uh, 12 to 15 years ago, because the United States EPA had been petitioned to uh, label nanosilver. Nanosilver is silver nanoparticles, okay, particles between five and uh, 50 nanometers, let's say, as pesticide. If a material is labeled pesticide, it's the kiss to death. You can no longer work with it. You cannot sell it. You cannot have people doing research on it. And we had the fortune or the misfortune, you go, like, at that time, you could call it the, that way, to even launch, to make some patents. And one company, HiQ, actually was created in 2005 based on our patents of nanosilver. And uh, this created a lot of uh, havoc. And the university actually told me, even though I, I had nothing to do with the company after we created the patents, people license, I personally am not involved. There have been about five companies now outside from our, my laboratory. I have no stocks. And by the way, yes, if I talk about companies here, I have no stocks, I have no board position, so I can freely talk. So this company now was created, but now I was responsible, or my laboratory was responsible because now it was apparently who had made a patent on particles that could have been toxic, okay? So the university actually requested to investigate. And that's what you see here is the, the results of this investigation that you will see now particles here of different sizes of silver. And we were able to show that the toxicity does not come from the particles per se, but rather from the ions that they are released from that. And this actually led the United States EPA, along with similar papers from other investigators, to allow and actually block that petition for naming nanosilver pesticide. Today, nanosilver is the fourth largest nanomaterial after carbon black, fumed silica, titania, these oxides. And now this is a, a major product. And uh, in December 2020, this company now did very well, especially with COVID, because what they had focused, nanosilver on antibacterial textiles. So they were making a number of antibacterial products. And in particular, you can recognize those masks here that all of us we wear, this FFP2. And in December 2020, that company entered the London Stock Exchange and was valued at the time 127 million British pounds. Today, it's twice that much the valuation of this company. But we will not talk about that. Today, we'll talk about another application. And this is about gas sensing device. This, is a, this has created a lot of excitement in my laboratory. My last uh, three PhD students, one after the other, they joined, you know, they make a company. And what is these devices now are focusing on uh, lifestyle, as you can see here, people, in, because people go to the gym, they work very hard, not nowadays with the COVID, that didn't, doesn't happen, but they don't see a difference. What's wrong? And uh, we are able actually to trace that the gym is good for some people, but not for everybody, and especially not for every lifestyle. You cannot go to the gym and then go have a six pack or a beer or a, or, a, or a pizza. This doesn't work. I mean, that's what we found out. And recently, and this is what we'll talk a little bit more, we're able to, de to detect methanol 
in the drinks. What is the so-called uh, the adulteration of liquor? People add in that, and now I have we are in contact with uh, various people, among them the Scots Association for Whiskies, the Quandro in France, and so on. Because we really, what I will talk to you today is this sensor, this flame-made sensors can distinguish this because people, Quandro in particular, this is the one that makes these beautiful French cognacs. They have problem in the Far East for people adulterating their products. So, and what you will see in this presentation, actually how all of this can go into your iPhone and you can have an app. So you can see the methanol content as well as the ethanol content of your drink. And that's what is all about of the seminar today. So I hope I can keep your attention in the next 20 to 30 minutes to tell you the story about this and hopefully some more fundamental work coming out of this. So let's get going here. And um, uh, what are gas sensors? Gas sensors is a business. If you look to all of these gurus, they say it's 2.3 billion year per year. Now, what does it mean 2.3 billion? It doesn't mean much to me. I mean, it's a mythical number. So, however, the impact is much higher it, than what the, we have these numbers here. Like in UK, where you guys are right now, they say false fire alarms costs about 1 billion in 2014. Cost now associated with asthma. This is an, an application of breath analysis by sensors. The, the, the costs are in the order of 56 billion in 2011, as you can see in the references over here. In terms of energy, in terms of combustion processes, Carbon Black, the biggest product out there. It's a business of 17 billion per year. And uh, the production volume, 11 million tons per year of Carbon Black. How this compares with all of this environmental work. If you go to a combustion conference, people talk a lot about soot and so on. The soot that is released from automobiles or from burning vegetation in uh, India or uh, coal in China, all of this soot that goes in the atmosphere is about 8 million tons per year on the average. Okay, So I want you to get an estimate what we are talking about with all of these numbers here. Having said this, let's look a little bit now on the fundamentals, what is all about the story of gas sensors and what it really means in practice. Sensors are important for air quality. You know very well from air pollution over the years, NOx, ozone, sulfur oxides, or carbon monoxide are well-known culprits of outdoor air pollution. Recently, there is a keen interest of indoor air pollution. For example, when you go, you buy a new apartment or a new furniture, and you have this characteristic smell of this fresh furniture, that's not good for you because it contains some of this uh, formaldehyde, which is quite a, a carcinogenic compound. But people don't know how to do that, how to determine if it is, and typically when you paint in or when you put a new varnish on your furniture, in my house, I have the windows to be open for several days before we move back into that room to really get rid of all of these uh, organics that really people cannot determine so quickly nowadays because they have to get samples, go to a laboratory, and you find results after hours at best, if not days. Another application for sensors is food and agriculture. You know very well the release of methane or ammonia during agri agricultural operations, but also in processing of ag products, most notably chocolate, let's see here, or coffee, acetic acid is a critical tracer of the quality of chocolate or coffee during their processing. Or if you go to a store to buy a steak, always what do you do? You look at the expiration date. But how do you know if someone for, didn't forget the steak outside of the fridge and then put it back in when you come to pick it up? Wouldn't it be nice to have an iPhone to truly look up and actually measure the ammonia concentration on its surface to really know if it starts going bad or not, don't go far. All of us will love bananas, correct? None of them is produced in UK. Usually they come from Central America and how they collect them. Usually they are as green as the Celtic colors, all right? So, and they come on my boat and they put them in ethylene to really ripen them until they come to UK, correct? That's how the business works. So wouldn't it be nice to have a sensor to tell you what is the level of all of those 
gases that actually can give us a flavor. And this is a potential application of gas sensors if they are selective enough, as you will discuss here. But let's go to something closer to, the, to ourselves. A lot of medical issues, a lot of illnesses can be traced to certain tracers in the human breath. For example, as I saw you on the cartoon on the slide a few minutes ago, acetone is a, is a tracer of lipolysis. This can tell you if actually you burn fat when you do exercise. The, the presence of acetone in the breath is a, a, a telltale sign that actually you burn fat when you work so hard. And usually this does not happen when you do the exercise, it happens right after. And that's what we have found out. So medical diagnostics, as we discussed a few minutes ago about asthma or fitness striking can actually be quite be effectively monitored having the right gas sensors. And now what are gas sensors? If you have a car, you go, you have to go to check every so often, once a year, if it is proper, the exhaust, and you see typically something like this that they put on the exhaust to make sure you know that uh, they are, the, the gas is coming in the right concentrations out. And how the sensor works, the basic physics, there are these two types of semiconductors. Is this the N type and the P type, depending if you are forming around the semiconducting, typically metal oxide, an electron depletion layer, or an accumulation, a whole accumulation layer. And these individual particles, of course, they are not single particles. Typically, they are a, a, a powder, a, a, a group of particles, and they can be agglomerated, the so-called point contact. And you can see here the particles and this accumulation or depletion layer are on the surface of these particles. Or these particles can be aggregated or necked. So making the particles at the right conditions, having the right structure is essential for sensors, as you will see in the upcoming slides. So how truly the sensors look like now? All these particles that we are talking about, they are right here. This is a tin oxide schematic here. This is on top of that. There are these interdigitated electrodes, typically made of gold or platinum. It is actually to transport electricity. And you can see here the bottom view, the bot, because typically the, another set of electrodes, the platinum heater, they will heat up the semiconducting oxide. And this is the side view. And this is a layer of the tin oxide. And this is an alumina substrate. And this with a gray line is the electrodes that we have here. And um, what you see here, a magnified uh, pixel here is this, the cross section. And on top of that is the semiconducting oxide. And below is the, uh, the so-called uh, insulator, the alumina that we have here. And on top of that is this gray electrode. An actual picture is right here. What you see, these fluffy, lovely particles is the tin oxide particles. And this is uh, the gray, the larger stones here. The scale is one micrometer, is the alumina. Inside, in between, you cannot see them are these electrodes, these interdigitated electrodes. So electricity or electrons, they will travel through this meandering structure of these filamentary particles to hit the electrodes and hit the signal that yes, a chemical reaction took place in the surface of these particles. So acetone arrived there. So now we have the actual signal to tell us that it arrived and it was sensed by the sensor. So what is the message here? We are really looking for porous, high surface area films. So how do we characterize the sensor? The sensor has to have high sensitivity to be able to de detect a gas, ammonia, acetone, you name it, stability to work for many hours, days, months, years, ideally. And nowadays, this is the critical situation where a lot of sensors they really struggle with to have the selectivity. Let's say you want to use this sensor for the breath. The breath has a thousand compounds and you only want to detect acetone. How to do that? The, the sensor has to be able to pick up the acetone in a very undisputable way. And the next is how quickly he does that and how quickly he recovers from that to sense the next molecule. So typically in the field, we have the so-called the three S and the two R's that the sensor has to fulfill. Having said this, 
let's come to what we as engineers are mechanical and chemical are really good at because a lot of this involves also electrical engineers a lot of gas sensing research is done in electrical engineering typically you have some nanoparticles nanostructure particles and you mix them with some solvents either lightly viscous to make a suspension and then by drop or spin coating you put it onto a sensor and some annealing you will make the film to be what we just discussed before or they can make a more viscous paste and this one will deposit it onto the electrodes that we discussed just minutes ago and by doctor blading or screen printing and this is how the sensors have been made in the last let's say 50 years now why we'll use combustion why we will use flames first we do not involve liquid byproducts this is a big advantage because when you have liquid byproducts you have to clean them up especially if you make something in large scale second you can capture unique metastable phases by this rapid heating and cooling that you have during combustion third involves as you will see even in this case few and fast unit operations fourth transport in particular diffusion is well understood to facilitate design from first principles and for this i will remind you your classes in basic transport phenomena where diffusion in gases is described very accurately by the chapman escook equation in contrast to diffusion in liquids where you go with the stokes einstein that there is a lot of assumptions coming out with the so-called steric effects so this accuracy of the chapman escook equation is of great benefit when you design gas phase processes because you can do that design from first principles and finally you can form as you will see here extremely porous but very robust films so let's see how flames do the job first of all a no-brainer you make the particles as you make them in the liquid phase you dry them and you cook them and you name it you can make them in the flame as you make soot and then again you go through the same lovely multi-step process and you do like what everybody else does in the field many people in combustion do that another way to do it is forget about all of that why bother when the flame can do it all because if you take advantage of the flame here the high temperature you have in the flame and typically this rather low temperature as you will see later on you can take advantage of that of that of this and deposit the particles by thermophoresis and these particles now that they contain noble metals and metal oxide which are the sensing particles look at another beauty you can actually connect that sensor with a resistance monitor and you can see exactly the point that you form a conductive film essentially you are looking at the point you form a, the, the percolation as we, we say in chemical engineering and this moment that you form that you know that you have formed the film you don't need to form a big film I think in fact the thinner the film you make typically the more attractive is not only because you use less uh, material but it also helps you with the response and recovery times as well as with the sensitivity now having said this let's see the specifics we have two distinct ways to do it okay we had this the direct that I just saw you flame aerosol deposition and the conventional deposition which one is better well, a, a study done at the University of Southern California by Professor Hai Wang, who is now at Stanford, looked actually at sensors deposited directly, the so-called flame deposited titania, as well as flame made titania by the same burner, an opposed jet stagnation flame burner, and then Dr. Blated. And what you see here, you see the sensor response as a function of the carbon monoxide concentration essentially the calibration uh, line of this uh, sensor and what do you see here you see that typically the directly deposited the flame deposited there are two to three times better have higher sensor response than the doctor bladed films and studies like that they have motivated us to pursue and the, the rest of my presentation now it will only involve this directly flame deposited uh, gas sensing films. 
By the way, if you take commercial P25, which is everybody who works with photocatalysis knows them very well, they do exactly the same. So the, the flames that you use to make titania, they can be as good as the commercial ones from the industry that you can buy from your chemical supply. Now, how all of this works out? First of all, typically when we try to make this direct deposition, people laughed at our face. No way, they told me. You put this flame on top of this electric circuit of this gold or platinum electrodes, you're going to melt them out. But if you are a good mechanical engineer, you know how to do that. As you are put you know, this heat here for, to deposit, you will actually, if you can remove it fast enough, and we did it by a plain heat exchanger, all right, what we would call a shell and tube heat exchanger, actually, this worked very well. The problem, however, was when you want to put shadow masks, when you want to make several of these sensors. What you see here is a shadow mask that you will actually, if you put it on top of this uh, film, on top of the substrate, you will make about 70 sensors. However, this tiny film of metal of the mask ruins the, the, the heat uh, transport. And although you make these beautiful lace-like films, if you just blow to them, gone. The whole film is out. Why? Because there's not the strong adhesion and cohesion, because this little metal between the, the substrate and the actual flame reduced the temperature gradient, so it reduced the cohesion and adhesion of these films. However, with our former student and now professor at the Australian National University, Antonio Tricoli, if you put a flame just for about 15 to 30 seconds, it will form these lace-like structures will go to cauliflower. How they will do that? Actually, the flame will induce some sintering. So you see these beautiful bridges here these nanoparticle bridges on this lace-like. What this does at one point, it forces now the fusion, the, the, the sintering, the coalescence. So these bridges in one, it's like the, the, the rubber bands. They, they break and then they snatch. And what you see here with these cauliflowers, all of these are this, if you like, rubber band of particles that they really form the structure. So what do we try to do here to improve the cohesion and the adhesion of these particles without increasing their crystal size? And that's how, why we make these stable films. And what is the final product? This one. Now you see here a silicon wafer. And you see this is this um, shadow mask that on top of that now they were this each one of these dots, it's one sensor. And each one of these sensors looks like this. You can see here, it's almost, you cannot see it's a transparent tin oxide film on top of this gadget. And essentially, you have now a temperature and the gas sensor at the same spot. Having said this, let's focus on the focus of our uh, seminar today. We want to make selective gas sensors by combustion. In this case, now we made by this technique, very good sensors for acetone. Let's say it's particular with tungsten oxide. You can see here acetone and all the other gases. Much more, this is a function of concentration of acetone and the sensitivity. You see the acetone stands out over ethanol, methanol, NO, you name it. Of course, we did it first with chromium, but chromium is a terrible material to bring it to the medical world. Nobody wants to hear about it. However, we managed to replace it with silicon, and this became our biggest success in the gas sensing about 10 years ago. You can also make sensors for with ammonia. In, in this involving molybdenum oxide. And then you see here as prepared the molybdenum oxide in the flame, beautiful platelates. But by doping them with silicon, the morphology changes to this filamentary and this rod-like structures. And again, if you look at the sensor response as a function of the various silicon content, and you can see again the ammonia over acetone or NO and CO, you see this big difference in the sensor response? This is a sign of a selectivity, five to six, as it is here also, a, a, a selectivity in the order of about a factor of 10 compared to ethanol, methanol, and so on. Similarly, isoprene, another important tracer you can do with the zinc oxide and the same story here. Another, you can see here now the sensor response. This is for isoprene, the squares. 
versus the acetone, the circles, or ethanol, the triangles. And you can see here, again, a factor of 5 to 10 in better sensitivity or essentially selectivity compared to the other gases. And you can see pretty good sensors down to five parts per billion, or in the case of ammonia, down to 400 parts per billion of acetone in the order of about 20 parts per billion. However, how good it is, this selectivity? Unfortunately, not as good as we would like to be. Why? Because in the real world, let's look at the acetone in the breath is about one ppm, but it has to compete with other gases. Meth hydrogen is also in your breath in the order of 10 ppm, methane. If you are in a room that you are using ethanol disinfectant as we do nowadays with the COVID, we are talking about concentrations 100 and more ppm. If you have drunk maybe a beer or two, you may have some ethanol in your own breath. And this is even another scenario that this will not be able to work effectively. So what is the order? What is the issue here? Orders of magnitude higher ethanol concentration, and this requires high selectivity. So the material properties are not enough. So we have to be more creative. What we have been actually being very successful, and actually that's what brought all of this new spin of companies to create it in that field, is this introduction of filters, or another way to call them is concentrators. By capitalizing on sorption, or size selective filters, or even catalytic filters. You can look at this, let's say, if you are aiming for this species with a green color to be able only those to arrive to your sensor. And now you can actually reduce all this competition from the other gas molecules to the sensor. So how this looks like, let's look at human breath. And if you look at the human breath and have a very nice sensor, platinum on tin oxide, we get, you know, to, to detect it, acetone, you can see sensor response, six ethanol, methanol, isoprene. You see here, if you look at the 30 seconds, acetone, it, it's a guagmire, the selectivity. It's not even a factor of two, ethanol less than a factor of two. However, if you take activated alumina, which all of us were familiar with these particles, commercially available, and put them on, what do you get? You get the identical signal for the isoprene, but nothing with respect to acetone ethanol or much later. What really, what is the physics behind it? Essentially, on this water layer on top of these activated alumina particles, it captures all the hydrophilic compounds, acetone, ammonia, ethanol, methanol, you name it. All of those are captured. So isoprene can actually escape through this as it flows through and you can detect it in the sensor. Of course, later on, that's what you see here, the acetone will come out, will be uh, desorbed from alumina. But if you focus your sensor in this early stage, now you can have selectivities in the order of over 100. And now you are in business. You can really have something to go to real world gas mixtures. And this for us, that was the our success story is by focusing on this methanol poisoning by laced liquor. You must read once a month people they, from various places like this year, a year ago in Mexico had 189 deaths or in Turkey, 50 deaths in October 2020. Thousands of people actually get intoxicated and go to hospitals. Some of them die. You can see here the headlines all over the world. And this is for two reasons. People, as you, if you know a little bit about distillation, when you distill uh, such liquors, the first part is comes methanol, and then comes the alcohol, which should make the drink. People sometimes add the methanol for added profit, or most of the times, when people do the so-called homemade distillation, they are not professionals. They don't know where to cut. Why? Because you cannot distinguish methanol from methanol by the smell. There is no difference between them. So this is a source of the poisoning and a lot of problems because the methanol poisoning from alcohol poisoning is two different things. Methanol will create blinding and even death, while methanol, we know the hangover. For ethanol, we know the hangover. So the one requires washing of the stomach, ethanol, while the other requires blood cleaning because essentially the 
this is what really creates the poison. Having said this, let's see how these sensors work. Here is our sensor with this white square to the left, as I have pointed out here. And then you see the, the separation column we have here, where we have this, in this case, it's a tenex, it's a polymer, where actually will be used now, as you can see on this side here. And these are rather big particles, so they, they don't create large pre pressure drop, while the sensor is what I have taught you already with these nice filamentary particles, as you can see here. And uh, this is actually put them in sequence. So as the gas flow goes, as you can see here with the arrows, my <laughs> cursor is a little bit slow. Maybe I will kill it. Maybe the other cursor moves faster. And uh, you see here, the gas flow goes like that. It will go through the separation column, come into the sensor. I hope you guys can see my cursor. And uh, if we do it like that, if you have the sensor only, you have the ethanol, acetone, methanol, you know, it's terrible. Look at this. All of them come at the same time. If I put them together as they will be in real world, look what you get, a single signal. You cannot distinguish between them. However, if you put the sensor and the separation column, first comes the hydrogen right away, does not absorb. Then comes after 1.7 minutes, the methanol, later on will come desorbed from the tenax, the ethanol, and later on the acetone and so on. These are, you know, for single gases, one after the other, okay? However, if you go down to put the mixtures, look at the beauty. They come right on. So the mixtures is not affected. So the, the column can actually separate them beautifully as you would expect, as you know, also from the classic separations, maybe with the, we know from our separation courses. Having said this, voila, here is the device. So as you can see now, again, our sensor over here, the separation column, and now this is the liquid, all right? This can be rum, can be whiskey, you name it. And over here now, you can barely see here is where we're gonna sample some gas from top of the fluid. And now this will go through all of this, the, the column first and then the sensor, and this is the pump that pulls all of that. And here now you will detect it with a and the wireless signal. And now you will be able with your iPhone to see what is the level of methanol, in this case, 3% or ethanol. So essentially a sensor like that, you can immediately see calibrate because if you have a, a whiskey, you know, you look at the label 40% alcohol tells you. The sensor has to detect the 40%. In that case, you are sure that the sensor works well and then tells you if your drink contains methanol or not. So to make the long story short, we have done this with a variety of, of, of drinks. First with water, you see here, water comes out and 1% methanol in the water, you see this signal and nothing else. If I have a beer, okay? Beer has 5% by volume alcohol on the average. And you can see first is the methanol and then the beer. If I take, a famous drink in Indonesia, Arak, it's about 40% by volume alcohol, similar to whiskey or cognac. You see now, as you increase the ethanol, the peak of ethanol comes closer to methanol. But even if I take an Austrian rum, the straw rum that contains 80% ethanol, you can see, detect this very well. So here now, we took drinks from all over the world. You can see here from Australia, from South Africa, from Chile, from Netherlands, from Korea, all right, and if I take all of them and put them with ethanol and start spiking them, you can see here the actual concentration and the sensor, it's right on. You can see a diagonal. How stable is all this? Quite stable. As you can see here, you get the two peaks, the ethanol and the methanol peaks distinctly, repeatedly again and again. Even later on, you get for days, even over three months. So this works really well. Having said this now, these kind of applications also help us to look again back on the fundamentals. So as all I talked to you very casually having these noble metals on top of the oxides, and you can see here the platinum, and we know from the sensors that if I have very little amount of platinum, I have a very good sensor, better than the pure, this is the sensor signal, 
as a function of carbon monoxide concentration. But if I put too much of a catalyst, or a, in this case, a noble metal, it's worse than the plane sensor. And we know that, actually, there has been work in the field, and they point out that the palladium loading, for example, it's optimal when it is in the order of about a fraction of a percent. But nobody really has explained all of this. And we try to take an advantage of our technology, because all of those are done in the classic way, if you know from catalysis, impregnation, precipitation on top of the particles. In the flame, however, we have a different ball game. And we want, actually, to understand why this is more effective. So in the flames, we discovered a few years back that actually, when you make the flames, you make some unique particles. You put particles, noble metals, on the surface, but also inside the particles. If it is silica, this can be 75% of the noble metal inside and the rest outside. For titania, depending on the concentration, can be as much as 60% down to about 10%, okay, depending. So we want to see what these embedded particles can do in, in the sensing. And this made very good photocatalyst as we did with Professor Fujiwara now in Yamagata University in Japan since three years ago. So we made this simple experiment. We'll make the flame and the flame, as I said, will make particles that they contain noble metal on the surface and inside, all right? Now, if I make some pure tin oxide, and I put them with uh, palladium nitrate and then do photo deposition with a platinum, a palladium precursor, they will have only particles on the surface. If I take my flame aid particles and actually put them in nitric acid and strip off all the surface, I will have here palladium only inside the tin oxide. See, look at these two contrasts over here, okay? Only outside or only inside or in between to have both. So if we leach these particles now, if they are fresh as you make in terms of uh, tin oxide, depending now on the concentration of palladium, you can have uh, to be on the surface between, let's say, 35% all the way to 60%. If I anneal them, as I have to do when I make sensors, this creates some fusion, this creates, and this reduces the amount that it will be leached. The 35 will drop to 25 and uh, let's say 60 will drop to about 40. So this embedding inside the tin oxide is similar to the other oxides as we have, have said before. This makes us feel good. So we are not having something out of what would be expected in flame synthesis of these oxides with noble metals. How it matters now, what is the bottom line here? So the embedded fraction can be as much as 75%, depending on the amount of palladium, the nominal, down to 60%, as I said, if we really embed them as a function of the content. Now, how it matters with respect to the sensing performance. And let's try to sense one of the easiest molecules in principle, carbon monoxide. The sensor response, if I, if I do these flame-made particles, don't touch them, again, we find out beautifully that we make at about 0.2, 0.15, this is the optimal performance of these particles as people have seen in Japan 10, 15 years ago. However, if I looked at these particles that I had leached them out, I took all the surface and only what is inside, if it's about half percent the nominal palladium content, it's twice as, if it is, you know, 1%, seven times, or if I go to 3%, almost a hundred times more effective. So what do we have here? We have clearly something new, but is it only for car carbon monoxide? If we do the same thing with ethanol or even acetone to uh, go a little bit faster because my time, I see with my timer is really up. So the same, these particles that they contain no particles on the surface, they perform better. So this, we really have a new product here, a new mechanism that has not been talked before. How good are these particles when they contain inside. Darn good. 50% relative humidity. You can detect acetone down to five parts per billion, as some of our best sensors we saw before. And this will come to the conclusions of my, slide, of my presentation that I hope I convinced you that combustion enables synthesis of new gas sensors, as you saw with this schematic earlier on. We can actually make highly selective devices that they can be made by our technology. And most attractive to me personally 
is uh, that this can actually help to solve a real world problem that you can quantify the methanol in the liquor, in sanitizers, all of the sanitizers that we're using, the Federal and, uh, Drug Administration in the United States has banned 170 sanitizers because they contain illegal amounts of methanol. Now this sensor, we are able to find this out also. And if you were making some of these sanitizers from uh, let's say fruits, from apples or from um, plums, they actually can, uh, plums can, uh, can contain more methanol than the regular ones. And most important, even on the human breath, we were able to detect it with these devices. And finally, the last few lines I talked on my presentation, embedded palladium 40 to 60% in flame made tin oxide, much increases the sensor response, especially at one to three weight percent palladium to carbon monoxide, acetone and ethanol, and most likely by transducing effect. We have shown before that actually having these metals, it's almost like oasis inside this metal oxide, oasis of conductivity. And this can facilitate the conductivity and probably in this case can be responsible for this enhanced sensitivity of our sensors. With this, I would like to thank you for your, for your listening to me all this time long and my students. Let's see Professor Fujivara here who have been this catalysis work we discussed, uh, Dr. Kelesidis I talked in the beginning and so on on this famous Alex Glacier in Switzerland. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, don't be shy to ask a question or you can send me always an email and you can see my presentation or that has, has been recorded and you can talk hopefully FaceTime in a conference down the road. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Patsinis. Uh, that's a fascinating and inspiring talk. Um, I'm, I'm really uh, impressed by the, the link between the you know, work leading research and, and the real world uh, solutions to various problems. Um, I guess we, we should have some really interesting questions here. Um, okay, Nenir, do you want to host this? And yeah. well, let's all, have you found some questions here in the chat? Uh, the people are a bit shy, but uh, okay. there is a uh, comment from Janis Venticos, our head of department of mechanical engineering UCL. That well known is... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I, I actually have some welcome. questions. Okay. Um, one question is about the uh, the difference between flame made particles and flame and deposition, uh, particle deposition directly. Now, obviously, the de uh, flame particle deposition method has uh, lots of advantage, um, including the high quality um, products. Uh, does that mean it it can only do, let's say, in a discontinuous way rather than a continuous way. Uh, for example, if you have the impinging flame, and um, first of all, I can see the deposition uh, may not be very uniform over a wider area, right? For example, in the center and the, the outer skirt probably. Yes, yes, I mean, air, uh, uh, exactly. Is really different. Uh, and also, you, be, be, you can't do it continuously, right? And uh, typically, the in a in a process like this, what you have, you and uh, ideally, I mean, if you are also involved in this, uh, what I saw now, my in situ monitoring, you know what is the optimal, and then if you go sensor by sensor to have something like this, you know, and you don't have to deposit very much because you need an extremely thin film. We are talking about in the order of one micrometer, you don't need much more, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, typically you can go, of course, uh, one by one in an assembly line, typically what you have this is uh, in, in practice, the, the most uh, standard ex example is manufacture of optical fibers. Mm -hmm. By over there, you have a similar situation, you operate and then you go, you make one bull and then the next one. So you typically, this, the industry is very familiar with processes like that. Mm -hmm. so, and in all, pro in all competing processes, if you look any other way, the liquid phase, it's same story. What is the advantage here? You get this high porosity because, and most importantly, you get the real time because this, if you go in the liquid phase, 
it's a black box. You don't know how thick is the film. You only rely on empiricism. You don't have a first principles to deal with. So this is the advantage. This is why we sold our soul to the direct deposition because of all of this simplicity. Okay, it is a matter of uh, making something uh, fast and reliable. Of course, requires some understanding of combustion. It's not easy. It's much always easier to take a spoon and do this doctor blading. It's it's much more uh, how can I say old fashioned, mm -hmm. and sometimes old fashioned gives you a good feeling. Mm -hmm. But this, we found out, at least we no longer work with that, only if we want to benchmark. I don't know if, if I answer your question, Kai. Yes, very, very well, indeed. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Uh, you probably have uh, uh, watched the news. <laughs> in some airports, including in, in France and, and possibly Norway, they actually use uh, trained dogs to uh, detect coronavirus, how does that work? Uh, well, dogs are used uh, for a long time. I mean, the most common uh, a, a, a example of dogs is in all of this search and rescue after earthquakes. And the problem with dogs is that uh, that's why we had a lot of people came to us to help them with uh, developing such sensors and to have actually a couple of papers for um, in that field. Why? Because the dogs cannot operate more than 20 minutes. They, they get tired because oh, okay. <laughs> it's not easy. I mean, uh, if, if you expose them, you need to rest them and then bring them back. It's not uh, talking about in your previous question of a continuous process. <laughs> it's not working very well. <laughs> so if you have uh, several. Now, in general, how you train dogs in all of that, typically you expose them and then after you develop uh, more or less, you, how can I say, you drag them. Right, that's how they do, how they find the drugs. Uh, have you seen when you go, at least me, when I go to the United States, I have always dogs sniffing at me, maybe hoping they will smell something, but um, it's, it's the same story. So do you believe the, um, the dogs actually detect the virus uh, or the, if, the if, other kind of smell or some, some other sense associated with the, the current? Uh, I, I believe uh, the dogs, uh, they can do the job if they will be trained. It's a, it's a matter of training. All of those is uh, a matter, you know, th there are, uh, these dogs are special dogs. It's not every dog that can do that because they go through this medical training, if I can use the word. Mm -hmm. Personally, I find it is very inhumane, but you know, at the end of the day, they save, they save lives. So yes. <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. <laughs> Can I jump in because I have a couple of questions uh, sure. myself. Uh, first, it's amazing to see how you have applied like this research to to try to solve daily um, applications such as the lifestyle. It was really, really interesting um, for the people in the gym. Uh, but also I was wondering when you are preparing the particles, uh, it seems to me that it's quite a complex uh, process. So how, how long is that um, pre-processing to, to be able to have those particles ready for the experiment? Actually, the, the, the particle synthesis is an extremely fast process. Every sensor that we make here is done in two to three minutes, no more. Okay. okay? Yeah. Uh, what is uh, difficult with the flames, if I can say, is that there is a so-called a, a, a learning barrier. Because when you learn, when you work with flames, with combustion, you have to have a, a safety training. You cannot just get in without thinking, playing with gases, you can blow up the place, okay? it's a, it is really, uh, there is a barrier because also I have to have hoods. I have to, all of this to vent it out properly, clean. However, the classic chemistry works like uh, the people, as people worked in the medieval times, okay? They take one spoon of this, one spoon of that, they stir it and voila, you have your particles, you dry them. And of course, it's, it has much less a uh, barrier to get into the liquid preparation. But what we have by combustion, we have different products. We make this epsilon tungsten oxide, which is really selective with acetone. You cannot make this in the liquid phase. Why? Because it's a metastable phase. If you go to the thermodynamic diagrams, you will see this cannot exist at room temperature. 
only at minus 40 degrees. However, if you make it in the flame, because you quench it so fast, you capture that face. And that's what you take advantage of. Similarly, with all of these filamentary structures, you cannot make them in the liquid phase. All of this very open. I mean, the films that I saw, let me give you some numbers. 98% porosity. You know what it means that? Yes. It's only 2% solid. The rest is air, mm. OK? It, it is a, a different product. It's amazing that it's holding all together with uh, yes, that yes. level of uh, porosity. But it's not, I mean, if you go to a dinner, you remember the good old days that we used to go to restaurants and the waiters, they took forever to bring us, you know, the dish. What do we do? Especially if it's a romantic restaurant that has a, a candlelight, <laughs> you will start playing with the bread plate, put it on top of the candle and you get this black stuff on top of the bread plate. It's soot, right? Mm -hmm. It's exactly what we do here. Instead of having black particles, you can have red, you can have green, all of these fancy chemicals we talk here about. Nothing more. It's of course, we don't use candles, we don't use wax, we're using some gas bottles and a little bit more. That's what I said, you require to have the safety training to get into my labs. Nobody comes in without mm -hmm. that. And I have another question regarding the, um, for the device to, to sense the methanol and the ethanol, um, because it seems quite compact, right? Um, yes, are you yes. thinking on doing like a survey for the users? Because ideally what you want is that the people without proper training, so the, the white public are able to use it with the right level of um, efficacy and that they can read well. Um, so have you done any surveys for that? Exactly, I mean, what we have done here, we have involved uh, several volunteers. We took breath samples. We took the breath samples and we spiked now in uh, so-called tetler bags, like in balloons. And then we tried to detect the level of methanol over there to make sure because we cannot make the people to drink methanol, all right? Uh, <laughs> this is not going to be permitted. <laughs> And it worked very well. And uh, what we have been actually widely using uh, all of these drinks, the, this works very well. And the, the whole story is to be able to develop a, a gadget. And I have seen it now, the, the people who made the company, they brought me and it's actually as big as the iPhone itself. Okay, it's, it's like the iPhone. And this is, you can actually take at the bottom of the iPhone, a little bottle here. And this is actually can tell you without, because the, their first customers, they tell me, are the manufacturers of uh, cognac and whiskey, because these people now, they want to make, um, you know, in the, even on this famous Johnny Walker, Shivas, all of these famous brands, you know how they rely on distinguished methanol from methanol? They have the so-called, uh, the connoisseurs, that mm. they, they have a smell, and then they tell you, cut it here. And then we brought our device. And of course, the first part, they did very well. They did as well as our device. What was very interesting is the second part of the distillation. The connoisseurs, they missed it. So <laughs> our device was able to pick it up. And the, the first customers of the spin-off of, of my students now, they seem to be the industries because they have an immediate need to be able to control the product yield because uh, they, they end up you know, throwing stuff that could have been good. And now this is why they decided three of them, not one, two, three of my PhDs to make a company and go do it. It is really good to when science has, has such a direct effect on um, a daily application. Daily, uh, life really is good. too short to do only science. You have to do something else also. <laughs> At the end of the day, I have to talk to my mom. What am I doing? What am I asking? I, unless I tell her I do something useful, she says I'm wasting my time. <laughs> you are for sure so if no one else have uh, questions um, from uh, the uh, can I have the final yes. question um, you, uh, you, um, you seem to be able to make a, a nano uh, silver or, or even gold right yes, from, yes. from the flame synthesis my question is that where where did you get the, the kind of uh, precursors ah, that contain the, the, the gold and silver uh, elements, but you know, 
supposedly not very expensive, right? <laughs> correct, correct. I mean, uh, typically in all of what we do here, uh, if you go, of course, to the companies like Sigma, Aldrich, and all of them, these are expensive precursors. But in all of our technology, for to be profitable, you have to use inorganic precursors, ideally minerals. And then you take these minerals, you disperse them in an organic solvent, ideally gasoline or kerosene, something cheap, and boom, then you have it. And the whole story is to do the science, right? To do, you know, this uh, so-called uh, control of, of particle size. We have now enough mathematical modeling, so we know we need two or three experiments because there are a couple of things that you don't know. Because when you make these particles, there are some oxides, some suboxides that they don't give you the pristine, let's say, cindering rate that you will find in the textbooks. Mm -hmm. However, if you find a good a connection, make three or four experiments, we develop the so-called effective cindering rates, which are the corrections to those. And that's how you work on a practical case, how you make the scale up, how you develop, let's say, the process. And after that, you can, of course, you can make improvements and you can do more deep science, but you have to make an impact. You have to make a product first. Mm. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sotiris. It has been great to having you and with your sense of humor. That's really <laughs> nice to have a speaker like you. Thank you for your time. Um, most welcome, Nelia. Most thank you very much, uh, you and all your people, for listening to me. And I hope to see you in a real yeah, <laughs> seminar hopefully. in a few months. Hopefully, mm -hmm. we'll put this behind us so to go back to the good old fabulous days. Yeah, sure. someday. Hope, hope uh, to see you at uh, ETH sometime. Um, anytime, anytime. When the, the, when the restriction is lifted. Thank you so much. All the bye best. Bye. It is. Uh, just uh, a quick um, reminder for next week, we will have Professor Nigel Brandon from Imperial College. Um, and we hope to see you there. Remember to register for our webinar. Thank you, everyone.